For purposes of teaching, it's customary to divide history, at least the history of the West, into certain very broad periods, such as ancient, medieval, and modern. And we do exactly the same thing with philosophy. We talk of ancient philosophy, medieval philosophy, and modern philosophy. And you'll find that most histories of philosophy are divided into those three sections. Ancient philosophy is dominated by the writings of two people, Plato and Aristotle. Of course, there were other important and interesting philosophers in the ancient world, not only before Plato and Aristotle, but also after them. But no one who has left writings of comparable quantity, caliber, and influence. If you went to a university to study ancient philosophy, you'd find yourself spending most of your time, and perhaps even all of it, on the work of those two philosophers. You'd then probably skip straight from Aristotle to modern philosophy, jumping over the medieval period entirely. Medieval philosophy has for a long time been the Cinderella of the subject's history, and we're talking now about a period of a thousand years or more, from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. I think the chief reason for this is that throughout that period, virtually every important philosopher was an ecclesiastic, whereas in the century or two leading up to our own time, there's been a widespread reaction against religion, especially against its hold on thought. During that reaction, medieval philosophers came under suspicion of not pursuing the truth wherever it might lead, but of trying to find good reasons for what they believed already. Like most reactions, including healthy ones, this one went too far. The greatest medieval philosophers were true giants, doing genuine philosophy as we understand it today, and we can still learn a lot from them. As in the case of ancient philosophy, among the medieval philosophers there are also two figures who stand out from the rest, though in this case they're at almost opposite ends of the period from each other. St. Augustine was born in North Africa in the year 354 AD and died there in 430. Two of his books are still universally acknowledged as being among the world's great literature, The Confessions and The City of God. The other figure of comparable stature is Thomas Aquinas, who was born in Italy in the year 1225 and died there in 1274. He was a much more technical sort of philosopher than Augustine. His most famous works are two enormous compendia, one called Summa Contra Gentiles, which has been translated into English under the title On the Truth of the Catholic Faith, and the other Summa Theologiae, or Summary of Theology. The death of St. Augustine and the fall of the Roman Empire were followed by the period we call the Dark Ages. During those centuries, it was as much as the literate and learned in Western Europe could do to cling to the remnants of civilization. They saw their role as essentially preservative, and for a long time, scarcely any new intellectual work of lasting importance was done. During the 700 years from Augustine to Anselm, there was only one philosopher of the front rank. John the Scot, who lived in the 9th century. But once we get to Anselm in the 11th century, we embark on a steady flow of significant thinkers. Just a few of the names are Abelard in the 12th century, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th, then Duns Scotus, followed by William of Ockham, and then the medieval period itself is beginning to come to an end. To tell us a little about this long but unfamiliar and fascinating period in philosophy's history, I've invited the master of Balliol College, Oxford, Anthony Kenny, one of the few contemporary philosophers to have written extensively about medieval philosophy and himself a former Roman Catholic priest. Anthony Kenny, before we start talking about specific issues or the work of individual philosophers, is there anything you'd like to add to that very brief sketch map of the period that I put forward just now? I'd agree with the, your choice of two philosophers to sum up the achievement of the Middle Ages, Augustine and Aquinas. But they're both very different people. Augustine is a, a solitary thinker, uh, somebody whose best known work, as you said, is an autobiography, is Confessions, a book drawing enormously on his own meditation, his own reading of the Bible, his own interior life. Aquinas is very different. He lives, as you said, at a much later period. And Aquinas is not a solitary figure. He is somebody right in the middle of a religious and academic tradition. 
He's one of the great order of Dominican friars. He lived his life within communities of friars. He's also a university teacher. Uh, one of his great achievements was the production of these two magnificent university textbooks. That's what his great works are. They're essentially university textbooks. An enormous contrast with Augustine, who was such a lonely figure that at the end of his life when he was a bishop, he was the only man in the whole town who had any books at all. These, these are, in fact, two perennial types of the philosopher, aren't they? The lonely, isolated, introspective thinker and the institution man, the university teacher. You yes, as you go on in the history of philosophy, you find people falling into these two types. Uh, in the pattern of Augustine, you have the solitary geniuses like Descartes and Spinoza spinning their thought out of their own heads, as it were. You also have the learned university professors like Kant and Hegel, uh, developing systems which were then to be handed on and modified to pupils and later generations of philosophers. Now, it's during the period that we're discussing, the Middle Ages, that universities were invented. And this very fact had a simply enormous influence on philosophy, didn't it, and the way it was taught, the way it was studied. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, I think that is one of the most important contributions of the Middle Ages to philosophy, uh, is that it founded the university. By university, meaning a, a corporation of people uh, engaged professionally full-time uh, on the teaching of a corpus of knowledge, uh, handing it on to their pupils, having an agreed syllabus, having agreed methods of teaching, and having very high professional standards. It's very remarkable thing how professional philosophy was in the Middle Ages. First of all, there's just the enormous output of the philosophers. Uh, Aquinas wrote, at about the lowest estimate, 8 million words. There are a number of other disputed works which might bring it up to 11 yeah. million. Yeah. Now, 8 million words is a lot to write. The whole of the surviving works of Aristotle are only a million works, words. The whole of the surviving works of Plato are only half a million. Aquinas, in quite a short lifetime, writes eight million words. And they're not words just tossed off. They're words that scholars to this day can argue about the meaning of. So the output is enormous. The rigor is very great. Uh, Aquinas's works bear the stamp of the medieval technique of disputation. It was one of the great medieval methods of teaching. Uh, the teacher would put up two of his pupils, a senior and a junior one, uh, the senior pupil would have to defend some particular thesis, for instance, that the world was not created in time, or for that matter, the world was created in time. The opposite thesis would have to be uh, presented and the main thesis attacked by one of the other pupils. The two would argue it out with each other. They had to argue according to strict logical rules, and then the teacher would settle the dispute, try to bring out what was true in what had been said by one, uh, what was wrong in the uh, criticisms made by the others. And if you open St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae, though it's not itself a record of, of live disputations, it bears the stamp of that. Whenever Aquinas is going to present a particular doctrine or philosophical thesis or theological thesis, he begins by presenting three of the strongest arguments he can think of against the truth of that thesis. A marvelous intellectual discipline, it prevents you from taking things for granted, makes you think, now, who have I got to convince of what and what are the strongest things they could say on the other side? That's, those are two of the things, the voluminous output, the rigorous method of presentation. Then there's the syllabus, uh, a university syllabus. Uh, means that you have a lot of topics which anybody going to university is expected to learn, uh, a corpus of knowledge that they're expected to master, a state of the art which they have to reach, and then they add their own uh, little bit, their own little stone to the cairn of the scientific edifice, and then hand it on to their pupils, uh, hopefully enhanced, but it must be preserved. Now, in the Middle Ages, the syllabus is set especially by the surviving works of Aristotle. Aristotle's works at the beginning of the High Middle Ages were translated into Latin. Very few of the great medieval philosophers could read Greek, but they had good translations of Aristotle, uh, and they worked a way to extract uh, all the knowledge that it was possible to extract from Aristotle and then develop it. Now, uh, before we come to the content of this, mm. there's one other question I want to put to you about the period as a whole. Mm. 
And it may sound, at first blush, rather a, a parochial question, but it could possibly have an in interesting explanation by way of answer. I think any British person coming to the study of uh, medieval philosophy is likely to be struck by how very many of the leading figures either came from the British Islands or spent a very significant part of their career here, say, as something like Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, that's true of those I mentioned in my introduction. It's true of John the Scot, St Anselm, Roger Bacon, Dun Scotus, William of Ockham. Is it sheer coincidence, or is there actually an interesting explanation for it? I think it is a striking fact, but I think that it's an optical illusion if it suggests that there was something specially British about <laughs> philosophy uh, in, the, I wasn't suggesting in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Uh, it's true that a lot of the philosophers spent some of their time in Britain and that some of them were British by birth. But after all, uh, Anselm, one of your figures, was in fact an Italian. Uh, and uh, Dun Scotus and William of Ockham spent quite a lot of their time on the continent. The reason why, if you picked any country, you would be able to say quite a number of the great philosophers spent time here, was because the European university community uh, in the Middle Ages uh, was very much a European uh, community. The Christendom, the, the uh, nations of Christianity, uh, were all a single academic community, somebody graduating in one university would go and teach in another university. All the universities spoke a common language, the Latin of the church, uh, and there was a great deal of academic migration, at least in the early Middle Ages. Later on, you get uh, nationalistic wars like the Hundred Years' War between England and France. That means that you get an interruption of travel. You get the development of the vernacular um, literatures, which means that people, even if they go on speaking Latin, are beginning to think in English. It's a significant fact, I think, that the, the last of the really great medieval philosophers um, was John Wycliffe, uh, just after uh, William of Ockham. And he was also, of course, is well known for the translation of the Bible into English, whether he did it himself or whether he got a gang of his pupils to do it. He was the inspiration of the translation of the Bible. He stands at the end of the international Latin academic community and at the beginning of the gradual fission of the different national cultures in their own languages. Now, one uh, concern that was perennial throughout the Middle Ages among philosophers, and you just started to touch on this earlier, was the desire to reconcile the great classic philosophers of ancient Greece, Plato in the earlier Middle Ages, predominantly perhaps Aristotle in the later Middle Ages, with the Christian religion, wasn't it? That was something they were preoccupied with from beginning to end. Can you say something about that? That was particularly so uh, with regard to Aquinas and those who succeeded him. Augustine uh, was much more interested, I think, in the philosophy of Plato than he was of Aristotle. And he was very much more interested in the, the Bible as a, a source of knowledge and information than he was in any philosopher at all. Augustine's presence broods over the whole of the Middle Ages, and he's regarded by the later medieval philosophers as, you might say, the best codification of all the religious knowledge that's to be found in the Christian tradition through the Bible in St. Paul and then through St. Augustine. But then when Aristotle is translated into Latin, they begin to realize in the 12th and 13th centuries that there's another great corpus of information about the world, about human beings, about why we're here, about where we're going, what we should do. And that is the philosophy of the ancients and especially of Aristotle. Aristotle was a genius in so many different ways. He founded so many of the disciplines that later grew into branches of philosophy and later grew into branches of science, uh, such as logic, metaphysics, uh, biology, psychology, uh, botany, meteorology, all these and many others are sciences which really began with Aristotle. And the most mature version of these sciences available to the early Middle Ages was the presentation oh, of Aristotle. I was going to ask you a question which bears on that. Uh, the question really is this, why did they care? Because of their commitment to the Christian religion, were they not of the view that Christianity provided them with all the knowledge of the nature of things that they already needed? Christianity provided them with enough knowledge for, for salvation that the 
the humble washerwoman who knew the truths of the Christian faith uh, and was completely ignorant of the, ignorant of the science of the ancients, uh, she had just as much chance of, of getting to heaven and living in glory with God uh, as somebody as learned as Thomas Aquinas. But it would be quite wrong to think of them, of people like Aquinas, as having only their eye on religion. They were um, men of intellectual curiosity who wanted to know all they could um, about human beings and about the world. Of course, they were interested in human beings and the world as God's creatures, but they thought that God had not only uh, things to tell the world through the sacred books like the Bible, but that we could learn a great deal um, about God's plans by looking at God's own creation, by looking at the world and what the different sciences could tell us about them. I think something that struck me very heavily when I came to read medieval philosophy for the first time was how much of it didn't have to do with religion. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much really solid work in logic there is, yeah. how much linguistic analysis of a very modern seeming kind to us there is, and then work in things like um, mechanics or psychology. I mean, the, the, the field is enormously wide, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's uh, the, the, the germ of many of the sciences which now have set up house on their own after the Renaissance set up as disciplines on their own. They're all to be found, as it were, children growing up in this great household of philosophy in the Middle Ages. The titles of some of the professors at the ancient universities uh, echo this. I mean, there is a professor of uh, physics in Oxford whose title is Professor of Natural Philosophy, because that was how the discipline of physics began, as the study of natural philosophy itself a meditation on the text of uh, Aristotle called the physics. The Aristotelian works themselves uh, traced out the syllabus for the Middle Ages. Uh, Aristotle's work began with the logic, which the science which he created, and which grew enormously in the Middle Ages. Uh, one of the first things which anybody going to a medieval university would learn was logic. And we've rediscovered in recent years uh, many highly refined uh, theorems and techniques of logic uh, which were quite familiar to beginning undergraduates towards the end of the Middle Ages. Logic at the Renaissance and the Reformation uh, was cut off short and only a small truncated torso of logic was then taught in most European universities until the end of the 19th century. Then in the 19th century, a new generation of logicians, mathematical logicians, people like uh, Gottlob Frege in Germany and Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead in Cambridge, they, coming to logic from a different viewpoint, from a mathematical viewpoint, tracing mathematics back to its origins in logic, uh, they set on foot a great new rebirth of logic, one of its flowerings was Principia Mathematica, the great work in which Russell and Whitehead tried to show that the whole of arithmetic could be derived simply from pure logical truisms if you studied them systematically enough. This rebirth of logic in the present century led to the rediscovery in the uh, 30s and later of branches of logic which had been totally lost since the Middle Ages. And it's only in my own generation that people have begun to put the two together and realize that some of the most modern ideas of logic were things that were well known in the Middle Ages. Would it be true to say that, that philosophy, uh, as studied and taught in Western Europe, was logic-centered in the Middle Ages, is logic-centered now, but hasn't been for most of the period in between. Would that be true? I would agree with that, and I think it's why one sometimes gets an extraordinary feeling of uh, sympathy and familiarity coming from a modern philosophical background and reading late medieval yeah. uh, I writers. I must say, that, that was true for me in a very strong way. When I read writers like Duns Scotus and William of Ockham for the first time, it was like reading the young Bertrand Russell, who you mentioned, or Frege. I mean, these were people obviously uh, serving in the same shop, so to speak. They yes. were in business at the same stand. I expected it to be something alien and distant and strange. And quite to the contrary, it was something utterly familiar to me. After the Middle Ages, people lost interest in logic and to a great extent lost interest in in language, at least lost interest in the philosophical study of language. They were very, very interested in the rhetorical and literary study of language, but lost interest in the philosophical study of language. From Descartes onwards, philosophers put epistemology in the center of their discipline. That is the question, how do we know? What do we know? How can we know what we know? Uh, logic and language go to the background. Since Frege and Russell and in the present generation, particularly in Britain and America, logic and language are in the forefront of philosophy. 
uh, the philosoph philosopher's great question nowadays is not, what do you know, but what do you mean? And the question of the meaning of what we say, the insistence that any other question, whether it's in science or mathematics or anything else, must be accompanied with a very careful awareness of what we mean by asking the question, if we're ever to get an answer. That's something that was very typical of the Middle Ages and is typical of philosophy again now, but had disappeared uh, in the intervening period. Now, I suppose the commonest charge made against medieval philosophy in general, and I mentioned this in my introduction to this discussion, is the charge that because it was carried out by people who were already committed before they started to the Christian faith, they weren't really, as I put it earlier, pursuing the truth wherever it might lead. They were looking for good reasons for what they already believed. What would your answer be to that accusation? Well, first of all, I'd say that it isn't necessarily... Um, a serious charge against a philosopher to say that he's looking for good reasons for what he already believes in. Um, Descartes, for instance, sitting beside his fire wearing his dressing gown, uh, was looking for good reasons for believing that and took a remarkable long time to find them. Uh, Bertrand Russell, who um, accused Aquinas of not being a, a real philosopher because he was looking for reasons for what he already believed. It's extraordinary that that accusation should be made by Russell, who in that book, Principia Mathematica, which I mention, takes hundreds of pages to prove to you that two and two make four, which is something he's believed all his life. But more seriously, I think that... The well, I, I mean, it's, it's worth interrupting at that point, I think, to, to say quite explicitly that provided it's acknowledged in a fully professional way that the goodness of the reasons is essential, then in a way it doesn't matter what you already believe, provided arguments and reasons are subjected without limit to fully rigorous tests. Yes, I think that's right. It doesn't matter what you believe as a philosopher. Uh, the, the philosopher is the person whose task it is to tell good arguments from bad. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't, in a way, matter what the starting or ending point is for a philosopher. It may matter yeah. a lot for other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, the distinction that you and I have just made between what you believe and the reasons for which you believe it is something that was very much brought out by Thomas Aquinas, perhaps more than by any other philosopher. Because he was committed to a lot of beliefs as a Christian. There were a lot of other things which he believed because he'd read Aristotle. And he's very careful to make a distinction between uh, these things. A distinction which we might say in modern terminology is making a distinction between his job as a theologian and his job as a philosopher. He sees his job as a theologian, above all, to articulate, make explicit, and defend um, the revelation of the history of the world and the future of the world and the salvation of the world contained in the sacred books of Christianity and in the teaching of the church. Um, as a philosopher, uh, his job uh, is to get as far as he can in discovering what kind of place the world is, in what truths we know, necessary truths about the world and about all of thought, uh, just using the unaided reason, not appealing to any alleged divine revelation. He, he makes a very striking point with regard to one specific issue about that, which sticks in my mind. He says at one point that if one considers the philosophical arguments, then there is no uh, uh, compelling reason why one shouldn't believe that the world has always existed. But as a Christian, he doesn't believe that. He believe, as a Christian, he believes that the world had a beginning because God created it. That's right. That's a very good example. There, uh, there were a number of Christian philosophers who thought that you could prove that the world must have had a beginning, essentially because they didn't believe in certain kinds of infinite series. Uh, Aquinas shows the flaws in their arguments and says, no, there's nothing self-contradictory in the idea that the world went on, ha has gone on forever and will go on forever, uh, as indeed Aristotle believed it had. So that Aquinas thinks that with uh, the unaided human reason, um, you cannot prove that the world had a beginning. Equally, you can't prove that it didn't have a beginning, and he objects to Aristotle, who thought it could. Yeah. Aquinas is much more agnostic as a philosopher. He says you can't prove it either way. Um, if you asked him, well, then, why do you believe that the world did have a beginning, he'd say, well, because it says so in the first uh, verse of the book of Genesis in the Bible. But that's something I believe as a Christian, as a theologian, uh, not as a philosopher. You mentioned his two great works at the beginning, the uh, Summa Contra Gentiles and the Summa Theologiae. 
Summa Contra Gentiles is meant as a philosophical work, that is, it's uh, directed to people uh, who are not Christians, who may be um, Muslims, who may be Jews, who may be atheists, and it aims to present them with purely uh, human reasons, with reasons that any human being of goodwill can see to be good reasons for believing that there is a God, that the soul is immortal, and so on. Uh, the Summa Theologiae is very different. It's addressed to Christians. Uh, it does accept as being good starting points for arguments that it says in the Bible such and such, though there's an enormous amount of philosophical uh, reflection contained in this work, even though its title describes it as a book of theology. Let's take now a particular issue about which there was uh, argument uh, throughout the period, the existence of God and whether or not this could be demonstrated. Uh, as you say, uh, it was clear to Christian philosophers that if they were addressing Muslims or Jews, it was no good appealing to the authority of uh, the church or the Bible because Muslims didn't accept that authority, so you were thrown back on argument. And they seem to me to have taken a very professional view of precisely uh, what, what did and what did not constitute uh, a good argument in this field. Now, I suppose the most famous of all arguments for the existence of God in the history of philosophy, at any rate, is the ontological argument. It crops up later in Descartes, in Spinoza, in Leibniz. It's even of interest to a number of philosophers today. And its classic formulation was in the 11th century by St. Anselm. Can you tell us what it was? Yes, but perhaps before I do that, I ought to explain to our listeners what an ontological argument is, what's meant right. by the word ontological. Right. Very good. That is, that in the uh, Middle Ages and later, there were two different kinds of arguments offered for the existence of God. Uh, one set, of which the best known are the five ways of St. Thomas Aquinas. They take as their starting point some feature of the external world, usually some very obvious feature of the external world, as that some things move from place to place, or that uh, some things come into existence and go out of existence. Starting with those and a few universal truths of philosophy, uh, St. Thomas will offer to prove to you that there is something which is recognizable as what all men call God. They are cosmological arguments because they begin from the cosmos. But the ontological argument uh, is a kind of argument which is meant to begin just from the notion of God, from the very conception of God. You don't, as it were, have to go outside the realm of ideas to get its starting point. Uh, the, as you said, the uh, most uh, well-known formulation of it is that of St. Anselm. Indeed, St. Anselm seems to have been the inventor of the ontological argument, whereas the other arguments are developments of things to be found in Aristotle. Now, Anselm's argument is very ingenious, it uh, takes as its starting point a, a definition of God. He says, well, God is, is something that you can't conceive anything greater than. Now, that seems a pretty harmless definition of God, and uh, somebody who didn't believe in God might, might accept it as a definition. And after all, if you don't believe in something, you need a definition of what it is you don't believe in. And so an atheist might agree, all right, I accept that definition of God as something that you can't conceive anything greater than. Well, then Anselm will say to the atheist, well, let's suppose that, um, that God only exists in the mind and not in reality. Of course, you, you've got to agree that God exists in the mind because you're thinking of him at this very moment and that's a way of him existing in the mind. But now, if God existed only in the mind and not in reality, then you could conceive of something greater than God because you could conceive of something that was exactly like the God you're just conceiving of, only existed in reality as well as in your mind, and that would be greater. Therefore, there would be something greater than God, but God was something that couldn't be, that, that than which you could conceive nothing greater, and you've just conceived of something greater than God. That's an absurdity. It's something self-contradictory. What led us to this a uh, contradictory result was the assumption that God existed only in the mind and not in reality. Therefore, we have to say that God exists in reality as well. Now, that's a sort of argument that when one hears anyone intelligent nowadays who hears it, is almost bound to think, well, there's something wrong with this. But the disconcerting fact is that when you try to put your finger on precisely what it is that is wrong with it, it's very difficult to do so, isn't it? 
Yes, I agree with you. I'm one of those who think there's something wrong with that <laughs> argument. But it, it's not any particularly modern uh, vision of philosophy that makes people think there's something wrong with the argument. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas spends quite a bit of time trying to prove to you that there's something wrong with that argument. He wasn't convinced by it either. But the most interesting thing is that a lot of the great philosophers through history have thought there was something wrong with the argument. They all give different reasons for saying what's wrong with it. And to this day, there isn't any consensus about what is wrong with it. Indeed, there isn't any consensus that there's something wrong with it at all. And there is a recently has grown up in America, uh, a group of philosophers of religion using the latest techniques of uh, mathematicized logic uh, to revamp the argument and to try and present it in a way which is uh, convincing uh, within the background structures of contemporary logic. It would take too long and I would need a blackboard to spell yeah. out how they do it. Yeah. Um, but it's something which, when I was uh, first coming to philosophy, was thought of as a completely dead duck. Mm. It is now alive uh, and living in Indiana and in California. Yeah. Earlier, you were drawing certain parallels between medieval philosophy and modern philosophy. I mean, you, and, uh, you've given us another one now with interest in a revival of interest mm. in the ontological argument. You were saying earlier that um, logic in the Middle Ages was language-centered. Uh, uh, well, yes, just to a large degree, logic and language-centered. And that's, again, true now, though it wasn't true for much of the period in between. And there seems to be another um, way in which philosophy now can be likened to philosophy then. And that is that after a long period in which moral philosophers uh, were not concerned with specific problems of living, but were concerned with the analysis of logical arguments and concepts and so on, they are now coming back to being concerned with what philosophers call first order problems. Now that was so in the Middle Ages, wasn't it, for most of the time? This, again, is a fairly recent change in the Anglo-American philosophy that you and I were brought up in. Um, I think at the time when we were starting philosophy, we would be told that the, it wasn't the task of the moral philosopher uh, to tell you whether it was ever permissible to tell lies or whether there was anything wrong with adultery or what were the criteria by which you would decide whether a war was being justly and fairly waged and so on. Uh, these were thought to be matters of importance, no doubt, but not the business of the philosopher. The philosopher's task was a second order task. It was to analyze the language and concepts which we use to make these first order decisions. Whereas in the last decade, I think there has been a great swing of interest back to the real live moral questions as being something uh, which concerns philosophers as philosophers, not just as citizens or moral human beings. There's been an enormous input from philosophers into questions of medical ethics, for instance, questions of the preservation of life and of such questions as when it is right to turn off life support systems, uh, whether it's right to experiment on embryos and so on. After all, in this country, it was a philosopher, Mary Warnock, who chaired the committee of inquiry into that. Uh, there has been, in particular, um, uh, an interest in the relationship between moral philosophy and the waging of warfare. I'd like, to st I'd like us to take this up because you yourself have written a book recently about nuclear deterrence. And one question to which you have to address yourself, which is central to, to your book, is are, you know, are there any imaginable circumstances in which nuclear war would be justified. And you refer to the whole medieval tradition of discussion of the just war. And you say in your own book that you think that any intelligent person ought to take an interest in these arguments. Can you tell us something about what they were? Yes, the, the theory of the just war is something of which there's the germ in the Middle Ages in Aquinas and in later thinkers. It gets more developed just after the uh, end of the Middle Ages in the post-medieval scholastics. But it is the question about in what circumstances uh, is it morally right to wage war? Uh, and if you go to war, uh, what moral constraints are there uh, on the way in which you wage war, on what you choose as targets, what you do with prisoners and things like that? Now, the, the theory of the just war uh, is a theory in the middle between two opposing views. 
on the one hand, there's the pacifist view that there's no such thing as a just war. All wars are immoral and wicked, no matter how noble the causes are for which they're waged. On the other hand, there's what you might call the view that no wars are unjust. That is, that though war is a terrible thing, once you get into war, there are no moral rules at all. The only moral imperative is just to win the war by the most effective possible means. Now, the uh, tradition of the just war says, no, neither of those are true. There are some values that are more important than life itself, and therefore uh, values for which you can uh, legitimately make war. But within war, there have to be constraints. Uh, the, there have to, has to be a, a good reason for going to war. The, the values for which you go to war have to be ones really important enough to defend in that way. And when you go to war, there are constraints on what you choose as targets. There must be no uh, deliberate killing of the innocent, whether by the innocent you mean civilians not involved in, in the war making or um, ex-combatants who are now prisoners and so on. Now, it's very interesting, I think, that this medieval just war tradition lies behind two of the most significant contributions to the debate recently about nuclear weapons. In this country, uh, the Church of England's book, The Church and the Bomb, uh, and in the United States, uh, the pastoral letter of the American Catholic bishops uh, on the use of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. Much of what you've been saying refers, though you didn't mention the name, to the work of Thomas Aquinas. Isn't it the case that Aquinas is now, as it were, the official philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church? I think we've just about come to the end of the period in which it, that could have been said. Huh. Uh, before the 19th century, though he was held in enormous respect, I don't think he was in any way the official philosopher of the Roman Catholic Church. He was perhaps the official philosopher of the Dominican order, but that's only a small part of the Catholic Church. Then in the late 19th century, Pope Leo XIII uh, wrote an encyclical letter giving him a special place in the teaching of philosophy and theology in Catholic seminaries and universities. Since the Second Vatican Council, I have the impression that the... Uh, hold of uh, Aquinas on Catholic institutions uh, has become much looser. And he's been replaced largely by other philosophers, I think not always by philosophers who are um, not deserve better. Not, 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 not always better. But yeah. they, I think, in fact, the reputation of Aquinas in the non-Catholic world has enormously gained from the fact that he's now no longer seen as just the spokesman for a party line. Mm. And uh, particularly in the United States, there's a growing interest in his work by people who aren't Catholics, perhaps aren't even Christians at all, who are just impressed by the sheer philosophical genius of the man. I'd like to take up one other question, which is always of interest to people outside philosophy, as well as in it, and which was of special interest to philosophers in the Middle Ages. And that concerns the question of what, what extent we have free will. Uh, in the Middle Ages, it was particularly important to uh, Christian thinkers because of the doctrine of grace. Uh, the doctor, according to the doctrine of grace, it, it simply is not up to us as individuals whether to secure our own salvation. I mean, whether or not we will be saved depends at least in part on divine grace. But if that is so, then to what extent do we have free will in any respect that matters? I mean, that, that was, in, in a way, the nub of the problem. Can you tell us something about that? Well, there were two problems in the Middle Ages interwoven, but one of them a, a philosophical problem and one a theological problem. The philosophical problem was the problem of reconciling divine foreknowledge and human freedom. Because uh, not only medieval philosophers, but most ancient philosophers and uh, Islamic philosophers who had considered the nature of God uh, thought that one of the things that we knew about God, if we knew anything about him at all, was that he could foretell the future, that he knew what was going to happen in the future. Well, of course, if we're free, if you and I are free, it looks as if what you and I decide to do today um, is what determines what's going to be the future tomorrow. But if God already knows what you and I are doing tomorrow, how can we be free to decide that today? Now, that's a problem which arises for anybody who believes in an omniscient God at all, whether or not they believe in anything that the Bible says about God. But there was a special problem for Christians, especially for Christians who took the version of Christianity presented by St. Augustine, 
uh, because St. Augustine, particularly in his later days, lays enormous emphasis on the fact that, uh, on the doctrine that nobody achieves salvation, goes to glory in heaven, unless they're predestined to do so uh, by God. And that was an extra problem for Christians. But what is interesting philosophically is that the patient work which was done by the theologians and philosophers in the Middle Ages, unraveling the concepts of freedom and the concepts of determinism to try to show uh, that the two are, can be reconciled. These are replicated often in ignorance today by people who are not interested in God at all, but are interested in determinism, and physical scientific determinism, determinism, scientific determinism. Yes. But the actual logical moves which somebody in the 20th century will use who's trying to reconcile physical determinism with our experience of freedom will be the same steps being gone through as somebody in the 14th century trying to reconcile divine predestination with human freedom. Alas, we're going to have to draw this discussion to a close. If uh, anything that we've said stimulates some of our viewers to go off and try and read some medieval philosophy, no doubt in most cases for the first time in their lives, have you any advice that you give them about where to start? I think that they, there are not many medieval um, works which are easy for beginners. This is because of what I said about it, most of the great works being within a university tradition. They are highly, tough technical. Universe, highly technical university yeah. textbooks. But there are two short books that one could pick out. The first is the one you yourself began with, Augustine's Confessions. I think that's a wonderful work. Well, it's one of the greatest autobiographies ever written, and I think it's probably the first autobiography in the modern sense ever yeah. written. Uh, it's full of a great deal of personal reflection, of uh, tender uh, memory of his family, of uh, insight into his own childhood and his own development. But it also moves on to the most abstract levels of philosophizing at the end of it, raising questions about the nature of time, which are still very much alive. Um, the other book which I would recommend is the Proslogion uh, of St. Anselm, uh, which is the book in which he presents that ingenious argument for the existence of God that I tried to paraphrase earlier on. I think your readers might find this interesting to, to look at that book. It only takes an afternoon to read uh, and see whether they think I represented his argument rightly and see whether they find it convincing. I said right at the beginning of this discussion in my introduction that for a long time medieval philosophy has been the Cinderella of the subject, and there's no doubt that that has been true in the past. But I'm also beginning to get the impression of, that, that, that and your own writings are perhaps one of the swallows that presage this summer, that there are all the signs of a revival of interest, a serious revival of interest, not quite perhaps with us yet, but on the way. Do you perceive that? Of course, it's only true of <clears throat> Anglo-American philosophy. Uh, that medieval philosophy has been a Cinderella. Uh, on the continent, medieval philosophy has been thriving for uh, as a, a subject of study for quite a long time. I think that the revival in English-speaking philosophy at the moment is particularly in America, uh, where there's a great revival of interest in all things medieval, not just in medieval philosophy. Thank you very much, Anthony Kelly. Thank you.